Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. This is the only scripture I'm probably going to get into today. It's real short. But it simply says this. It says, for the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, awake, O sleeper. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. Turn to somebody else and say, wake up. This is why it is said, awake, O sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. I thank you so much for this time right now. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for just your presence, your anointing here as we worship you, as we lift up your name, and as we draw closer to you. Father, I pray for that same spirit that sets us free, that same anointing that breaks every yoke, that same presence of God that gives us hope, that transforms our lives, that causes your word to be alive and living and active inside of our hearts and minds and souls. Father, I ask you right now to just to just be active and manifested in this moment as we look at your word together today in Jesus' name. Why don't you put your hand on your belly somewhere and just, just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, speak to me today. Open up my eyes. Open up my ears. Let me see what you want me to see. Let me hear what you want me to hear so I can do what you want me to do. And be everything you call me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. Turn to somebody else, give them a high five and say, wake up. If they're not awake yet, slap them in the face. No, I'm just kidding, don't do that. About, uh, about seven and a half hours ago when I woke up to begin praying and getting ready for this morning service. Seven and a half hours, you, really? Nobody's like, really? Nobody's questioning that? That was three in the morning. Thank you for your uh, confidence that I got up at three in the morning and been praying for the last seven hours. But no, that, that's not how I got up. But, but a few hours ago when I got up this morning, ma'am, I was real groggy. The alarm went off, and I, wasn't, I just wasn't quite awake yet. And this literally just happened, literally this morning just happened a few hours ago. I woke up. It was dark, of course, in the bedroom still. And I, and I woke up, and I, and I did what I assumed I have done literally over a thousand times in my life as I got up, walked down the hallway, and made the left turn to go into uh, my bathroom to use the restroom. And this morning, for whatever reason, I assume because I was just a little sleepier than I normally am, when I woke up, I, I somehow overshot the bathroom door in the dark and turned and walked right into the wall of my hallway in my house. Has anybody ever done that before? And this the thing is like, is it, and it's a little weird to do that because, like I said, uh, it's not like we just moved. It's not a new house or anything. Like I've, I've made that walk in the dark and made that turn a million times before. I'm real good at it. There's really no reason that I should be walking into walls in my house at this point. I mean, it would be understandable if we had just moved. It was a new house. But, but no, I've, I've lived there. We've lived there for about five or six years. Like, literally, I've made that turn, made that exact same walk thousands of times before. And uh, there's really no reason for me to do that. The only explanation, the only reason that that could have possibly happened is because, yes, it was dark, but I was also still quite asleep I wasn't quite awake enough and, and literally the moment that happened I thought you know what that's why it's so important that's why Paul is so adamant where, where if you read this in, in most of your Bibles you'll see that that phrase that Paul is is is, is quoting there awake O sleeper rise from the dead it's 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 got exclamation points it's, it should be in big bold print it's separated from the from the rest of the text because Paul is like shouting this to the church wake up and I think the reason is this is because listen, I can I it's if I'm just even a little bit awake, I can make that walk in the dark. In fact, I can walk around most of my whole house in the dark. I've been there a long time. I know it pretty well at this point. You understand what I'm saying? I can walk around most of there's no reason for me to run into walls, miss turns, miss doorknobs or miss doors in the dark. However, the combination of it being dark and me being asleep can be a little dangerous. And I think what we need to understand here is this. When the times are dark, when the world that we live in is dark, and when it feels like at times it's even getting darker, we need to understand that when, the, when it's dark outside, the church of Jesus Christ, people of God, sons and daughters of God, when it's dark, we cannot afford to walk around and go through life asleep, spiritually speaking. Amen, somebody? Now, before I start yelling and shouting and pointing the finger when we get real down 
on you or root down the church. But this is not a condemning word. This is not a condemning message. Because I want you to understand that Paul is speaking to the Ephesian church. By all metrics and measurements and, and numbers that we could add value to, the church that Paul is writing to is wildly successful. The Ephesian church, if you look at the book of Acts, when Paul launched and started the Ephesian church, starts with a mighty, mighty move of God. In fact, Paul, really Ephesus becomes Paul's kind of home church. He, Between Ephesus and Corinth, they were the two churches that Paul was really probably the most hands-on with and, and pastored and led in a personal way. And, and we know from other historical data and artifacts that the Ephesian church grew to be an absolute mega church. They met in fact, we, we know from history that the church in Ephesus was so large and had so many thousands of people that on Sunday morning they would take over the Roman Colosseum that was built in the city of Ephesus because it was the only place big enough to hold that large of a gathering of people. It was literally a church of thousands of people that had received Jesus. So it was a huge church, wildly successful full of the Holy Spirit, with the Apostle Paul as their pastor. Later, Timothy would be their pastor, and even later, the Apostle John would be known as the elder of Ephesus and have a hands-on role. And I say all that to say this, that even this giant church with a great move of God that was reaching thousands of people with the Apostle Paul and Timothy and John as their pastor, even they needed the kick in the pants once in a while and a reminder to say, hey, don't fall asleep on this walk. Wake up. Amen? So if the church of Ephesus with Paul and John and Timothy and all these great giants and heroes of the first century church leading the way, if they needed to be reminded to wake up once in a while, guess what, friend? We need to be reminded to wake up once in a while. We need to be shook a little bit once in a while. We need to be reminded that we cannot afford to walk through this life asleep spiritually. God's command is, listen, God in this hour, and I believe it's more true now than it has ever been, him. We desperately need, and God is searching and looking to pour His Spirit out on an awakened church. Amen. Somebody turn to somebody and say, Wake up. Now, this word awakening in the original Greek language comes from this Greek root word agor or agora. And it not only means to wake up from sleep. But it means to rouse yourself, to, to kind of, you know, snap out of it. You know what I mean? You ever been driving? You ever been driving and, and, and late at night and you're tired and you start to get real sleepy? You know what I mean? Anybody ever done that before? I know I'm the only one that's ever drove when they're sleepy. You, you've tried all the tricks. You know, you ever, tried, you ever tried just sleeping with one eye open and rotate back and forth? It doesn't work very well. You roll the window down, get that fresh air, and, and all of a sudden it's making you more gen. You, I mean, <laughs> you got to, how many have ever slapped yours? I've slapped myself driving before going, man, wake up, let's go. That's kind of what we're talking about. It means, it means to rouse yourself, to, to come to. Maybe you're not completely out of it, but you're just kind of, you're just kind of sitting there. You're not, wake up, rouse yourself. It also means not only to wake up or to get up or to, or to come to, it also has to do with gathering, coming together. In fact, the Greek root word agora is where we get our English word, you may have heard of this, agoraphobia, which is a fear of public places or a fear of large crowds or a fear of gathering. Now, I hate to be hitting this, but listen... <laughs> We have spent the last couple of years in our world and in our culture in a season where we have been told over and over and over again that we should be afraid and we should be worried about gatherings. We didn't gather in this building a couple of years ago for several months through Easter and all that. And that's fine. I'm not angry. I think we did the right thing. I think we've continued to do the right thing. We will continue to do what we feel like is in the best interest of, of, of whatever we need to do. But what I do want to counterbalance that with is this. Is we as the church of Jesus Christ and we as sons and daughters of God, 
better understand that a big part of what God has called us to do as the body of Christ is gather together for the preaching of the gospel, the lifting up of Jesus, encountering his presence, encouraging one another, growing together. And listen, that is awfully hard to do when you are isolated and singled out in solitary confinement at home in your living room. If that's the only option, then that's fine. We want to, we are still part of the family, but listen, I want to share with somebody that part of being awakened means I'm going to have to find some way, somehow, to be a part of the gathering of God's people. Amen? And if it can't be in person, we've got other options available. I just want to challenge you say, listen, if you, are, if, you are, if you are staying away intentionally from the gathering of God's people and it has anything to do with the spirit of fear or a spirit of, of, of bowing down to the age, listen, I believe in Jesus' name. It's time for some people to wake up, to get back together, gather again, and do what God's called us to do. Amen? Let me say it this way. I believe right now, two years removed, this is, I just, I'm not saying this with anger and I'm not, please don't hear this with any condemnation, but this is what I sense the Holy Spirit saying. It is time for the church to get up, to gather, and get back to what God has called us to do and who He has anointed us to be. Amen, somebody? It's time to get up, gather, and get back to what God has called us to do. And who he has called us to be. That's, that's, Paul is saying all of that when he says, awaken, awaken, O sleeper. When you go to sleep, it's a time to rest, it's a time to recharge. Hopefully we're going to sleep because... We've put our work in and we've done what God's called us to do that day, whatever, whatever, wherever that's, whether that's, I don't care if that's in a classroom, a business room, a factory somewhere, or in a church somewhere. Listen, if you, you, we do it all to the glory of the Lord, and we sleep to get rest and get ready to go for what God has next. And I've shared this before, I believe wholeheartedly that part of, part of God's over, see, here's the thing, did God cause did God cause a global pandemic? No, I don't believe that at all. That happens because we live in a sinful, broken world. And uh, tr- the, Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Amen, somebody? But what God will do is he will take the trouble that's released in the world as a result of sin. And when I say sin, I don't mean a result of any one person's sin. I just mean sin is a force that exists in this fallen, broken world that will not be eternally redeemed until Jesus returns. Amen, somebody? And so because we live in a world that is ruled by sin at, in, at this present time, waiting for its redemption in Jesus Christ, ultimately, bad things happen. But what we have a promise of as children of God and the sons and daughters of Jesus and followers of Jesus is that God said, I will take the trouble that exists in the world, and for those who love God, I will redeem it, I'll turn it around, and I'll use it for my glory and for my purpose. Amen. Amen. And I believe wholeheartedly that a big part of what has happened over the last couple of years, especially at the beginning, was God was giving some folks and some and 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 the work, the intention, and God was going to turn that around and use that to give some people a time of rest. Amen. I believe some of some of our church things. Hey, we needed to take a break from some stuff that we were doing, that we were just doing without any meaning, without any thought, because it was tradition, it was religion, and we needed to figure out, hey, what really is important? What are we really doing here? Is the church, is us coming together, is it essential or is it non-essential? When we find out real quick, you know what? It's essential, amen, somebody? The fact, and, and, and so and so we, we had to, but we had to retool and rework, and, and we needed to go into a little bit of rest, and some of you in your families, in your homes, in your lives, man, a couple years ago was the great, that, that forced rest, 
For some of you, that was one of the greatest things that God ever did in your life. God turned that around and said, hey, let's slow down. Let's, let's remember what's important. Let's remember what's valuable. And it's not about a jam-packed schedule. It's not about this thing and that. It's about the people around us that God has called us to do life with. And those but listen, all of that is good and all that as well. But I'm telling you right now, listen, this is what I, this is what I sense now. And I'm not at all saying that we got to go back or, or we should go back to what it's supposed to be. What I am saying is, is church family, listen to me, listen to me now, listen to me, kingdom-minded hearts and souls. i, I got to say as clearly as I can. I believe that now the Spirit of God is saying, hey, that time of rest is over, and it's time to get back to work. And if you're still waiting, if you're still resting, if you're still staying away, if you haven't come back yet, if you haven't gathered back yet, if you, if you, what, listen, God is saying, it's time, your rest is over. It's time to get back to work to the things of God. Amen, somebody? Now, some of you have never, have never stopped it, so don't tell, don't hear me saying that I think you have, but I'm saying there's some of us that need a wake up call right now and need to say, you know what, man? It's time to get back to the things of God. It's time to put God first again. It's time to get up get back together, and get back to what God's called us to do. Amen? Now, when you wake up, when you wake up from your sleep in the natural, you are not only waking up to the world around you on the outside, but the life that's inside of you begins to express itself in your bodily movements. You're moving around, you're breathing, your functions, what you're doing, your eyeball, you begin to see. And the reason that happens is because of the life on the inside of you. Are you following me so far? And the same thing is true, listen, spiritually. When I begin to answer the wake-up call, when I begin to wake up, to what God has called me to do and to who God has called me to be, you know what's going to happen as a, as a direct byproduct of that? The life of God is going to awaken on the inside of me. Amen? And I believe as the Lord is, is saying, it's time to wake up, awake, O oh sleeper. As the Lord is saying, rise up from the dead. The season of rest is over. It's time to get back get back together. It's time to get back to what God has called us to do. Listen to me close. I believe that as we allow ourselves to be awakened to that, God has some new things that he wants to awaken on the inside of your life. Amen, somebody? Listen, there are gifts on the inside of you that have been sleeping for a long time that God is ready to wake up. There is life in you ready to awaken when you wake up. There is kingdom calling and kingdom purpose on the inside of your life waiting for you to wake Wake up and hear the alarm clock go off in or around you. God saying, wake up, son. Wake up, daughter. There are gifts. There is power. There is anointing. There is calling. There is ministry. There is purpose. There is destiny. There is the life of God on the inside of you ready to be awakened when we wake up. And listen, prayer and fasting is one of the key tools in our arsenal to awaken spiritually to the things of God. Amen? In fact, I know of really no other tool in my life when I feel like I'm kind of groggy spiritually, going through the motions, nothing has any meaning, the Word of God seems like black ink on a page, I pray and I feel nothing, I would come to church and 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 and, and it's just it just feels old hat, it just feels tired, it just feels this, it just feels that. Well, guess what? That's a good sign that I might be a little sleepy and I need a wake up call. Amen, somebody? And there's no better way to wake up than with an intentional season or time or moment of prayer and fasting to awaken the things of God on the inside of my life. Amen. That's what this next week is going to be about. Awakening, not only awakening to what God has called us to do as the church, not only awakening to what God has called you to be as a son or daughter of God, but awakening the spiritual realities and the life of God on the inside of me and you. Amen? 
Now, that word fasting, some of you might be real intimidated. You think fasting is something that, uh, you know, old church ladies do and people that are way more holy and spiritual than you do, or, or maybe fasting is only something that you do for 24 hours before you go have a real awkward, uncomfortable moment in the doctor's office or whatever else you think fasting is. Listen to me. Listen to me. I don't care if you've never fasted all, at all, and you can get this on, online. This is available at, at redlightchurch.com. Here at the end of our service today, we're going to come around this altar, and you've got cards right on the back of this sheet right here. This, it says Awaken 2022. Right on the back of this is some guides, some, some, some guidelines to help you figure out fasting. But there are all kinds of different ways to fast. Obviously, the most obvious way, fasting just simply means to push away. It, mean, it means to exclude something, and biblically, it, it means a lot to do with food. And you say, why is why is that, why would pushing away food be so powerful? Why is that a tool in our lives? Well, here's the reason. Let me explain that to you real quick. When God created man through Adam and Eve in the book of, in the book of Genesis, what did he say? He said, let us make man in whose image? His image, right? He actually says, let, let us, if you notice the language, he's, he's actually speaking to himself, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He says, let us make man in our image, right? Because God's not a crazy person. He's not talking to himself. Let me make you in my image. That would be insane, right? God's not crazy. He's, it's hard for us to understand, and I'm too stupid to explain it all to you in a way that's going to satisfy your curiosity, but so you just have to, just have to trust some of these things by faith. But God is three persons, three in one, one in three, all three equal, but all three different, <laughs> I don't know. He's God. We can ask him when we get to heaven. We'll figure it out. But that's what he is, a triune being. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So he says, let us make man in our image. Now, we stand a reason that if God is a three-part being and made man in his image, that we should probably also be three-part beings. Is that Would that make sense? If we are made in the image of God and God is three and one, one and three, we are probably three and one, one and three in some form or fashion. Yes. Well, that is absolutely true. You can find these, this language played out in the book of 1 Thessalonians. When the Bible said, Paul writes, let us be sanctified, mind, body, and soul. Everything giving glory to God, okay? So we are three part beings. We are, we are a mind, we are a body, we are a soul, okay? Our mind or your heart, that has to do with your emotions, your logic, your ability to reason, your ability to calculate, your ability to figure things out. That's all part of what we call our mind, or we might even call that our soul as well, because a better definition for our soul, what we probably think of, is actually our spirit, okay? I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's, let's start with this stuff. First, we're, first we're a body physical flesh. God said he formed man from the dust of the earth and created his flesh. Our flesh is our bones, our marrow, our, our skin, our organs, our blood. Uh, it's our base desires, our need to, re our, our desire to reproduce, our desire to uh, feed ourselves and to eat and to drink water, to have food, clothing, shelter. All of that is accompanied into our flesh part of us. Amen, somebody? And then we have our soul. I've already talked about that. Our mind, our will, our heart, our emotions, our logic, our reasoning, our ability to calculate. That's all part of what we call our soul. But then the Bible says that when God formed man, not only he formed us from the dust of the earth, made us with a body, and gave us the ability to reason and to feel and to have emotions, he also, then the Bible says, breathed his life into us. And that is the Greek word ruach, which is also the Greek word, which is also translated spirit. So literally God took of his spirit and breathed it into us. Follow me? So that we are a mind, or I'm sorry, we are a body, a soul, and a spirit. Okay? Now, when we were originally created in the book of Genesis... We were created as spirit beings. Our life came from our spirit. You follow me? Man wasn't alive until God put a spirit inside of the body that he had made. You follow me? So we are, our life, our life, the source of our life comes from the fact that we are actually spirit beings, Okay. That's the original intention of God's plan, that we would be spirit beings that were housed in a body that had a mind and a heart and a soul that would give glory to God and obey God and, and, and be available to worship God. Does that make sense? Now, when sin entered the picture, what happened with sin is that it flipped around the order of who was in charge. 
Because when God made us and said it's good, our spirits were number one, our mind was in between, and were number two, and then our bodies were following what our spirit and mind did. Sin said, you know what, I'm going to put my appetite above my obedience to God, so it flipped around who's in charge, and that's why in, in, without, without discipline, without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the God's redeeming work in our heart and our mind and our soul, and giving, giving credence to the life of God, the Spirit of God inside of us, we are basically just base desires, creatures, going around living ruled by our flesh. Does that make sense? Then follow me. Now, the most base fleshly need that we have is to eat okay some of us myself included have a little more desire to eat than others but what fasting does especially when it's food what fasting does is tell your body tell your flesh hey you are not in charge of this life amen and by pushing away or making room or denying for a season something that is so base flesh. When I say base, I don't mean sinful. We have to eat. But something that is so ingrained in just who we are to survive, by pushing that away, you know what will happen? It makes room for the life of God, the Spirit of God, to be a little more active in your life. Amen? And so through fasting, and again, again, let me, let me say this as well. Because <laughs> you fast, you can fast to go on a diet. You can fast to because to, you have a doctor's appointment. Those are all areas of fasting, okay? This is not what we're talking about. I'm talking about fasting with the intent of awakening something on the inside of us. Amen? It has to be done with the spiritual intent behind it. You follow me? So when I fast and say, hey, I'm calling a fast. I don't care if it's a day, two days, three days. I'm pushing away the fleshly part of me so that I can give room for the Spirit of God in me to take over. And when I come through that moment or when I come through that season of fasting, it, listen, let me say it this way. If I can deny myself some food, I can deny myself anything. Amen? If you can learn to tell your flesh no on your favorite food or whatever for, for a time, You'll learn, that you can tell your, you'll learn that you can tell your flesh no when it's trying to gossip about somebody. You see, see what I'm saying? When I learn and discover that I can actually control my flesh and, 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 and live with a little bit of hunger once in a while and fill that hunger up and fill that space up with God, fill that up with the Word of God, I, I learned that there's a lot of temptation that I actually can say no to, that I'm actually strong enough, that the Spirit of God is alive enough in me. Amen, somebody? That's what we're talking about. That's why fasting is so important. And that's why it has the ability to awaken the life of God on the inside of us. Now, let me give you some tips about because I've been, I, I know, I know, I'm, I know I'm a big boy, but, but I have, I do have a lot. I, I'm just, I'm not saying this to be proud, but I've, I, I've done a lot of fasting over the years. A couple things I've learned. Number one, for Justin Bradley, Justin Bradley has to be led by the Spirit to fast for the most part. Every time I've tried to fast that it was just an idea I had, I almost always fail. Every time I know that I've been led specifically by the Spirit to fast a specific thing or whatever, I'm, I'm, there's always there seems to always be an empowerment and enablement. Not that it's not hard, not that there's not many moments where I've had to say, okay. And let me just say this. I've done a lot of fasting. I've only done, I've done two 21-day, in my life I've done two 21-day only liquid fast, okay? Only two, in my, and I've, I've been following Jesus and fasting for, for a good chunk, and, and especially this January, beginning of the year, for many years of my life. It's been a big part of my Christian experience and my walk with God, okay? <clears throat> only two times have I gone 21 days with only liquid, and it was because I knew God told me to do it, okay? You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so, there's a, so what kind of fast we got? Is it okay if I talk about this for a minute? You guys give me a few minutes here. I want to end this somewhere good, but some of you need to, we need to hear this. So there's a full fast, which would be liquid only. And let's not get crazy. Listen, if God tells you to do water only, do water only. Do whatever God tells you to do. But you know what we're not going to do? We're not going to judge other people's fasts. <laughs> 
I remember one time I was fast. It was actually in the middle of that 21-day fast. Let me just tell you this. I know, I know that I'm talking about the Spirit of God awakening, but there's a lot of flesh that has to die while you're fasting. Okay? It's going to be real common over the next few days for some things to surface in your flesh, some, some attitudes, some, 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 am I very pleasant a lot of times in the middle of a fat? No, my wife was like, nope. I remember one time, right, I was in the middle of one of my, tw- of, a, of one of the 21 day fasts I did liquid only. And I, listen, when I say liquid only, I usually do protein shakes, I'll do smoothies, I'll do like some broth or whatever. Uh, you know, I'm not getting, I, it's, we don't need another thing to be religious about. Amen, somebody? And I remember, I remember I was drinking a smoothie and somebody was like, Somebody was like, somebody from our, not this church, another church in the league, saying, well, I wish I could drink smoothies and I was fasting. And I was like, lady, you're about to get punched in the face. Because I was like two, I was like two weeks in and I was just, I was like, literally, I thought I was going to die. And I was like, you're, you have the nerve to judge my smoothie <laughs> while you're eating a flipping cheeseburger. Uh, I'm going to choke you out, right? Honestly, you're about to be like. I hope you're prayed up because you're meeting Jesus today. <laughs> so we're not going to judge. So do do what God. So so there's a full fast, liquid only. You can do that. We're going to go seven days as a church. That's what I'm encouraging us to do. Maybe you can only go one day or two days or three. Participate in some way, whatever you can. Amen. You don't have to do liquid only. You can do what's called a Daniel fast. Okay. This is actually in the Old Testament. The Bible says that Daniel, this is where the 21-day fast comes from and the Daniel fast comes from. Because the Bible says that Daniel had a vision and a dream from the Lord. And the Bible says that he, he fasted for 21 days, but he didn't eat nothing. The Bible says that he, he ate only fruits and vegetables, had no meat, ate no sweets, had no wine for 21 days. And he just ate basically fruit and vegetables and prayed and sought the Lord to give him, to give him an explanation. So there's a Daniel fast. So you could do that. So, so a Daniel fast, listen. And it's a Dan, the Daniel fast, that's just what, here's the thing. We look at things in the Bible and go, oh, well, if you're Daniel fast, you can only eat fruits. The Daniel fast was not just about, it, the Daniel fast was to say a fast can be pushing away any certain types of foods for a season in order to seek God. Amen? So, so maybe, maybe you want to push away sweets for a week or however long God tells you to do it. Maybe you want to push away meat. I've done Daniel fast before, too. I hate them. Honestly, I would rather do a liquid-only fast than a Daniel fast because I just don't eat. I don't like fruits and vegetables that much. <clears throat> it gets boring. <sighs> but it's good. Okay? So that's another type of fast. A Daniel, a Daniel fast can be full-on Daniel fast, fruits and vegetables only, you know, hardcore as you want it to be. Or can, a Daniel fast can also be any pushing away of any certain type of food. Okay? Now listen, listen. A type of food that you would usually eat. Okay, if you're already a vegetarian and don't eat meat anyway, you'd be like, oh, I guess I'm gonna, I guess I'm doing the Daniel fast. You know what I mean? No, 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 that's not. What, okay, it's pushing away something you would already have. You know what I mean? If you don't eat oatmeal, and, and, and you're like, well, I guess I just won't eat. I'll just fast oatmeal because I'm not gonna eat that anyway. Like that's, that's not what we're talking about. You're, you know, <laughs> follow me. Okay, you can also do a fast that would, that would be from like, a certain time frame of the day. Like from sun up to, you might say, well, I'm going to, I'll fast from sun up to sundown. I'll, I'll, I'll eat breakfast, skip lunch, eat dinner, something like that, six to six, or whatever works for your schedule and whatever works for you. That, that's also, a time. listen, I'm just telling you, I, I want you to understand there are all kinds of ways to participate and get some of the benefits of this and to participate in what God's going to do in this awakening week of prayer and fasting for the next week that, that, that you might, I don't want you to disqualify yourself before without understanding. Does that make sense? And let me tell you about let me tell you about set up to sundown fast. They don't work for me at all. The reason for that is because I'm a glutton. Okay, so so what I will do is I will starve myself, but then I will eat. Not only will I eat all of that day's worth of food, but then by sundown I'm eating all of last week's food too. You know what I mean? And then I end up just feeling miserable for the rest. So, so for me personally, it typically doesn't work out very well. It just if I just because I just feel like uh, I don't I'm not supposed to. I, don't, I just don't like feeling that full and bloated and gross <laughs> when I'm going to bed at night. So let's just, that's just me personally. I don't do it so fast. But some, if you're more disciplined than I am, go for it. This is, I just, I can't encourage you enough. Participate in some way. Amen? Amen? Here's the other thing I want to challenge you to do. 
right, you can do it right now, you can do it later, it's, gonna, it's in the, the, the things right here, but we have a text, we got them set up, they're ready to go every day this week, beginning tomorrow morning at I think 7 a.m., if you text the word AWAKEN22, AWAKEN22, all one word, to the number 88202, that will put you into a text list, and every single morning this week, you'll get a scripture and a devotional that will be sent to you, and let me just tell you something, ma'am, let me, let me say something what I've seen over the years and what is so powerful about this time. When a group of people, when the people of God, when a church, when a family of God in a local corporate community, when we begin to pray together, fast together, and read the same word together, man, it brings a corporate anointing and atmosphere where lives are transformed, miracles take place. Listen, I, I will never forget when we were, we were leading a church in the middle and we were doing a 21-day fast one time, and in the middle of that 21-day fast on a Sunday morning, people all of a sudden started getting healed. People's backs started straightening up. People with rods in their legs and in their bones started getting healed from years and years and years of pain. And I'm, I'm, and I'm telling you why. It's because when we begin to focus our effort corporately together on Christ, listen, the Bible says that one can chase 1,000 to flight, two can chase 10,000 to flight. There is a multiplied anointing when the people of God come together and things begin to happen and shake in the atmosphere. Amen, somebody? I'm ready to see some things shake loose in our community. Come on, somebody. I'm ready to see some darkness flee. I'm ready to see, I'm ready to see us do what God's called us to do. And we have, we have listen. This house, we are called to be a movement. Amen, somebody? I can't speak for any other church, but I know what God's called Red Life Church. God has called Red Life Church to do in Brookville, Indiana. And we are not a country club church where you're just going to come and have a nice little safe place to clap your hands and sing a few little fun Christian songs. and have a, No, no, we are here to be a force for the kingdom of God. Amen, somebody? And if that's... But to do that, we've got we've to we've create the atmosphere for that to happen in, in our lives. Amen? And that atmosphere is only created with prayer and fasting. Amen? <clears throat> so text AWAKEN22, 88202. Get here to prayer Monday through Friday, 7 o'clock. Get here every night you can. Get here every night you can. I said this last week. I know, uh, well, I'll, you know, i got to work in the morning. I'll be tired. Listen, listen, some of you before you came to church and before you gave your life to Jesus, you used to stay up all night long partying, drinking, smoking, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and you would get up and go to work the next day and not think a single thing about it. Listen, don't tell me you can't, don't tell me you can't, don't tell me you can't come to, and, and pray and seek God for a few days. Come on, somebody. And I'll, just, I'll, say, I'll say this again. <laughs> There are a lot worse ways that we can get ourselves tired than because we stayed, we stayed up too late praying and seeking the face of God. Amen, somebody? We're not going to be here till tonight. We're going to be here probably 7 to 8, 830. Let's get after it. Amen? All right, I've, I've talked a lot longer than I intended to today. I'm sorry. I've got to finish this one thing here. Paul says, awake, O sleeper. And then he says, rise from the dead. I want you to notice that here in the New Testament, Paul likens a sleeping Christian to a dead one. Think about that. And if you think about that, it's true. Listen, <laughs> a sleeping Christian is just as effective as a dead one. Amen? I can do just as much sleeping as I can if I were dead, which is to say I'm doing nothing at all. Amen? Okay? A sleeping church is just the same as a dead one. We are just as effective, just as powerful, and just as anything else. And here's the thing. We fall asleep in our lives when we get comfortable. Amen? It's hard to fall asleep when you're not comfortable. But when you get comfortable, you get drowsy, you get tired, all of a sudden you begin to fall asleep. Play a song or something, Eric, so I'll start to wind this thing down. And the reason that some of us in our spiritual lives, in our Christian lives, we find ourselves asleep is often because we get comfortable. We get comfortable, we get in a routine, 
we get in a rut. We, we, we know we, we, we have the same schedule. We go to the same places. We go to the same stores. We, go to, we do the same stuff. We come to the same church. We, we just do this. It just, and all kind of just becomes old hat and routine. And before long, we get real comfortable. And before long, we can get drowsy. And before long, man, we're just going through the motions and we're asleep. And when we're asleep, we're just as effective as when we're dead. Amen? But I believe right now, I believe right now in this moment, in this week, what this week is about is about allowing some holy discomfort to be exercised in our lives. To allow some holy discomfort. Can I shake this and not wake and break it? I think so. To shake us a little bit. Say, hey, man, let's, let's get uncomfortable a little bit. Well, if I miss, if I miss breakfast, I get a headache. I don't know. Okay, it's me too. Well, if I don't eat lunch, I get a stomachache. Yeah, okay. So do I. Okay? I would love to tell you that, man, the Spirit of God is just going to overwhelm you, and you're not going to feel hungry, and, and you're not going to have any side effects, and you're not going to have, I mean, so, some of us, man, if, we, if, 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 you're, if you're addicted to sugar like many of us are, and you push away sugar for a week, you're going to have, you're going to have withdrawal symptoms, baby. You're going to feel them. I would love to tell you that God is not going to let you feel any of that. You, he might. He won't, but he might, but probably not. But we need a little holy discomfort once in a while to wake us up from our slumber. Amen? And I believe even right now, some of you are here today, some of you are right because some of you, the reason you're here right now is because something happened that awakened some, some holy discomfort inside of you. You thought, man, i I, I got to change something up. i got to do something new. I, I just feel like something's not right. You know what that was? That was the Holy Spirit making things uncomfortable in your life, shaking you a little bit. Why? Because he wants to wake you up. And man, it would be so easy to look around the world, to look around at what's happening in our lives, to look around at what's happening in our nation, to look around at what's happening in the world, even to look at, look at the church, not this church, but just the church in general, and go, oh man, the church is ineffectual, the church is dead. I mean, I mean, I mean, we... we we, 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 we didn't get together for a long time, some of us, and, and, and it's still, you know, there was no change, nothing happened. Listen, you know what, you know what, man? There's a story I was going, I was looking at this week. Many of you, you've probably heard it before. Man, Jesus, they came to Jesus one time in the, in the New Testament, I believe it's in the book of Luke. And so-and-so came to Jesus, they said, hey, hey man, our, our daughter's dead can you come pray? Can you come be with the family? Can you, can you maybe come pray for the girl? The Bible says Jesus walked into the home, saw everybody there, the family gathered, and they were mourning. You know the story. The Bible says Jesus walked in and said, hey, everybody out? This girl isn't dead. She's just asleep. And I hear the Holy Spirit saying that over his people, over your life, over your faith, over what God has called you to do, over your dream, over your purpose, over your destiny, over what, over the thing that God has placed you on this earth to do, over things that maybe you have thought were never going to happen, maybe dreams that God gave you or things you were believing for. Man, I hear with the resounding roar of heaven, Jesus saying, it's not dead, it's just asleep, but there is an alarm clock going off in the heavens today, and I hear the Lord waking his people up like never before. Friends, it is time for an awakening. This thing called the church, this thing called ministry, the kingdom of God, it's not dead. It may be asleep, but it's not dead, and we're going to wake some things up in Jesus' name this week. Amen, somebody? If you're ready for an awakening, why don't you stand up in this room? If you're ready for the things of God to awaken in your life like never before, come on, why don't we get out of our seat? Why don't we begin to worship? Come on, just begin to worship right now. Just begin to ask the Holy Spirit to awaken right now. Come on, church family. Here's what we're going to do. 
I want us to come around this altar for a moment. There's a reason we have this out here. I want us to go into this week of prayer and fasting. We're going to call this thing, I'm going to, I'm going to call this thing to order. That's what the Old Testament said. They said in the Old Testament they would blow a trumpet and, and call the fast. We're going to blow the, the trumpet here this morning by coming together. We're going to receive communion.